Welcome back to GTN's Coaches Corner. Now you guys keep coming up with the brilliant questions and we're going to continue to do our best to answer them. That's right. Today's questions include what to look for in a tri suit, sock choice, race day cramps, how to get faster on the bike, and racing in poor conditions. So let's get to it. Before we get started with your questions, remember to hit the globe so that you can subscribe and not miss any of our GTN's videos. And remember, you can ask your own questions. Just use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner below this video or any of our videos and we'll be answering your questions in a future episode. So let's get to our questions. Yeah, well, our first one comes from Joe Williams. Hi, guys. After a couple of years in triathlon, I'm about to invest in my first tri suit, previously worn just tri pants and a cycling jersey. You've done some videos in the past about how good specialist aero kit can be, but how much difference is there between an entry level but well fitted tri suit and a more expensive aero kit? And is it worth investing the extra? Well, I mean, that's really a personal choice. So you're not going to lose that much. I mean, obviously that difference between your shorts and your top is not going to be a massive penalty. It all really comes down to fit. Uh, mm. A aero tri suit can fit really snugly. There's not going to be any trips where the, where the air is going to get stuck on it. So it will be slightly more aero and it'll be air, more aero in all positions. And that's probably a big factor because it's going to be more aero regardless of whether you're sitting up or you're in your aero bars or whatever it might be. So that is a good point, but it is a lot of money to spend on an upgrade that is, well, it's essentially a marginal gain. What it comes down to is comfort. You wanna make sure you're comfortable and also practicalities. A two-piece is a bit more comfortable, maybe for the swim. It's easier to put it on the top after the swim. It's also a bit, you can get bigger pockets, for example, in a two-piece. Uh, and also on hot days, it's a little bit more breathable and a little bit cooler. So you need to weigh those up and decide whether it's worth your while to spend that money on a tri suit. The aero advantage is minimal. Yeah, I think the difference there between an entry level tri suit and sort of a top end of the range is huge when it comes to price. But ultimately, if you can find a tri suit that is comfortable and fits you and doesn't have any rubbing points, and that is the main thing when it comes to a tri suit, because you've got to be wearing it for the swimming, the cycling, and the running. And remember, yes, it might be aero on the bike, but is it comfortable when you start moving in the upright running position, for example? Does it feel restrictive when you're swimming? So there's quite a lot of that which won't really be dictated by how much you spend. That's just purely on spending a bit of time to make sure you get the right fit with it. And like James mentioned, those aero gains are quite small and ultimately if you are going for an entry suit, it's maybe going to be a little bit less aero than a top end suit, but you can make far bigger margins with your training and your position on the bike than you could with spending an extra couple of hundred pounds, for example. Yeah, I'd say go for comfort over those aero gains first. So whatever you're most comfortable in. Our next question is from Daniel Findlay and he says, I always see the GTN crew running around <laughs> with mid calf length socks and I wondered if there's a difference in what sock length you should wear for running. I've always worn low cut or no show socks, but do crew length have any additional benefits? Thanks and keep making your videos. Um, I mean, I don't know whether there's a practical reason. You I wasn't even sure if this question was serious, but I thought it would be a fun one to answer anyway, because yeah, we do all wear, it's sort of socks have got longer in running, almost like they have in cycling, and it's kind of followed that trend. Yeah. But I don't, we don't do it for any fashion statement or any benefit, I don't think. Yeah, I've I mean, never been accused of being fashionable. Yeah, I don't so think any of us have that, have that concern. <laughs> I mean, there are a couple of benefits. I like it if you're running in kind of ankle length grass or there's nettles or things, it protects your ankles and your lower calves. Or if you're running in sand, it stops the sand going inside your socks. Yeah, it can definitely help. Your shoes, but it stops again. It can help with gravel and that kind of thing. Mm. And that's probably the reason I started wearing longer socks. I also used to always wear low low socks or no show socks when I was running. Just more comfortable, it's cooler. Obviously I was in South Africa, so it was, it was pretty hot when I was running growing up and I always wore really short socks. But then I started running more and more on gravel and you get those tiny little stones that get into the gap between your Achilles and your, and your sock and it just made more sense to wear longer socks. And then I got used to it, got comfortable with it and now I wear longer length socks all the time. Uh, there isn't really a specific reason. There isn't a significant advantage. There are some socks out there that will claim to be compressive and they obviously they'll go higher up your leg and they will help with the return of blood uh, that's coming going down to your foot. Uh, but those gains are very marginal. Unless you're doing a really long race where you might actually get some swelling in your feet uh, that becomes an issue, they're not going to make any difference whatsoever. So it really just does come down to what you're most comfortable with. There are no rules and the UCI is not going to pass any rules on how long your run okay. socks need Let's to be. Let's hope not. Soon. But I would just say it's another opportunity to have some really funky patterns because there are some just really beautiful socks out oh, there. She's back on the fashion <laughs> thing, so I'm going to tune out. Okay, now. time to move on to the next question, which comes from Florian Turcon. 
GTN Coaches Corner, thanks for your, con for your amazing work. Oh, I have a question related to T1. On race day, every time I get out of the water, I've got hamstring cramps throughout T1, and then when I jump on the bike. It can't be muscle fatigue or lack of electrolytes as it's the beginning of the race, and it disappears after a few miles within the bike. What could it be? Too much buoyancy and not using legs enough during the swim. Well, Florian, first up, I would actually start by asking, are you sh you're saying it's definitely not fatigue, but the fact that you've been swimming and you're getting on the bike, you're changing what you're doing. It could be something to do with the actual swimming yourself. And you, you comment on too much buoyancy. Well, the wetsuit can change your position. So I'd be interested to know how much training you actually do in your wetsuit. And it can be using different muscles that maybe do all your training in the pool. It could be maybe fatiguing your hamstrings. I've actually found myself and a friend of mine has had really fatigued hip flexors from using a wetsuit just because you're having to actually push against the wetsuit that's pulling you back up. So that could be one of the reasons. I think that's probably the most likely reason, in fact, uh I think this is quite a common thing actually cramping in T1 or cramping as you run out the water. Uh, as you say, you not really use your legs very much in the water, so there's not much blood flow to them and then suddenly you're running through transition as fast as you can. Uh, you've been holding your body in a different position, your relaxed hip flexors or your tightened hip flexors, your relaxed hamstrings and suddenly they're all working in different ways uh, and you cramp. Uh, this is quite common and as Heather says, the solution is to practice, not just practice swimming, it's swimming in your wetsuit, it's also practicing that transition, it's practicing running out and changing the, your body position. Uh, one trick you can do to do this, and we do advise all our athletes to do this, is to kick a little bit more in the last 200 to, to 300 meters of the swim. Just really focus on bringing those legs into the, into the swim so that the blood is flowing through them a little bit more, you can feel them a little better when you first start running, and you're not risking this cramp uh, just from basically holding your muscles in a position they're not used to. Yeah, totally agree. Right, uh, moving on then. Michael Mortensen. Hi, GTN. Being a try rookie this year and done a few races, a quarter hour man format, one of a ton of things <laughs> being the fact that I simply cannot get my average speed up on the bike, much beyond the point of 30 to 31 kilometers an hour, whether it's on a closed circuit or when commuting. I know my FTP is an FTP drop here is 240. I mean, that doesn't mean much if we don't know your, your weight, but um, and thinking about my next term goal, I thought I might have a stab at getting faster on the bike, but what approach would be the one with the highest yield? FTP based training intervals or what might you suggest? Well, I think you pretty much have to do everything. This is the problem with bike training. You can't just do FTP training and think you're going to get through a bike leg of, an, of a triathlon much faster. You will see some improvements if you do FTP training because most of the race should be around about that zone. But you also need to do high intensity stuff. You also need to do some strength work and really work on that leg strength so that you can get through the whole uh, bike leg without slowing or fatiguing. Uh, so you basically need to build a program that ticks all the boxes. So you need to do some strength work in a session. You need to do some FTP work in a session or intervals, you need to do some high intensity stuff in a different session. And then of course you have to do the endurance, which is the long ride. Uh, now you can do, you can double dip in sessions. So you can do some of these and hit two of them in one session, for example. But I think you're probably gonna find that what you've been doing is none of these things. You haven't ticked any of the boxes. All you've been doing is getting on your bike and riding at 30 that's... to 31 kilometers an hour on your way to work and on your way home and then in your training. And that's why on race day, that's what you're doing. You can only do what you train. So the trick is to train the way you need to race or train in the zones you need to race and the things that the race is actually going to require. And then you'll have those extra gears on race day to go a little bit faster and push a little bit harder. Yeah, that is the danger of commuting, isn't it? Because you just want to get to work as quickly as possible usually and just think, right, I'll go hard, but you're not going to structure in those things. So maybe you might have to be a little bit more disciplined with that. But also look at your position on the bike because you can gain a lot from there and that doesn't require as much hard work. Or if you've got a bit of money to throw at it, maybe look at some upgrades for your bike, but that might be seen as cheating, I don't know. Buying speed's not cheating, is it? <laughs> okay, our final question for today, and it's Audrey Bouquet and he says, my next triathlon takes place in a week and a half. Uh, uh, that's probably already gone now. Uh, but the weather looks pretty bad, rain and cold. How to organize your race in these conditions? What are the pro tips for racing safely? Thank you, and thanks for your reply. Uh, well, <laughs> You're asking the right people. Well, yeah, you're asking us See, here in the UK. We know all about racing in the rain. Uh, not that I did, I used to live uh, where it was a little bit sunnier. Anyway, <laughs> layers are your friend when it comes to racing in the rain. Essentially, you want to take your time in T1 and make sure that you're wearing the right clothes for the conditions. Uh, now, this 
may seem like a waste of time, especially when other people are running straight through transition as quickly as they can just in their skimpy trisuit, uh, but they will pay the price later on if it is cold and wet. And being cold and wet on the bike is dangerous. So it's also a safety aspect. You need to be able to, to be comfortable on the bike. You need to not be shivering. You need to be able to grab those brakes without freezing cold hands. So take your time in T1 and make sure you wear the right kit. If that means putting on arm warmers, then take your time to put on arm warmers. If it means putting on a full rain jacket, put on a full rain jacket. It is worth it to get through your triathlon safely and as fast as possible. You will lose more time getting hypothermia on the bike than you will putting on that rain jacket in T1. Yeah, 100%. And even if you get through the bike and you're going to take so long to warm up on the running, you see pros wearing jackets in really bad weather. So it is just being prepared and having those options and maybe even chucking something in a pocket if you've got that space in your tri suit and or you can take your jacket off as you go. Um, for safety that James touched on, it's worth maybe having a backlight you can just turn on as you're leaving T2 or T1, sorry, just to make sure that you're visible. And just be aware of the rain of the roads, especially if it's not rain for a while, of grids, white lines, etc. You just need to be a little bit more vigilant, just like you would be if you're riding your bike normally in the rain. But in race situations, sometimes you can go for that racing line and forget about those things. So still just, I think, be sensible. And when it comes to the run, you can always put a different jacket on or if you've got cold on the bike, always have things in transition so you've got those options and you can think about that before you head out onto that run. Yeah, that is an important point on the run when it's raining and cold. A lot of people get to the end of the bike and they go, well, I won't have the wind chill anymore. Take off the jacket, I'm going to be running. I never get cold on a run. Uh, but in a triathlon, you might find that you run a little bit slower than you did once you're fatigued from that bike and you can get cold pretty quickly if it's absolutely pouring with rain. So make sure you actually carry enough on the run too as far as warm clothes go and also nutrition because you'll be a little bit more hungry uh, on a triathlon where it's raining and cold. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the last one I'm thinking of when I'm talking about this, uh, Mark and I did Helvellyn triathlon and it rained for the whole of the bike. It was just miserable. And then for the run, I thought, oh, do I need my jacket? Well, we're going up a massive mountain and I kept my jacket on for the whole thing. I even finished wearing it. So um, yeah, that, is, that wouldn't be one that for is you, not my cup of tea. <laughs> no. No. In fact, you probably need a cup of tea on the bike <laughs> for me to get through yeah. that. Well, thanks for sending your questions. Remember, send your questions down below and we could be answering them in next week's Coach's Corner. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.